Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. Merhaba, Kardashim. My name is Adam Jones. Uh, great book today. Art of Happiness by the big dog himself, the Dalai Lama. His, uh, I would say Chage Man. His, that? his Holiness, Dalai oh. Lama. <laughs> no, I was just trying to wait. Hey, Chage, Dalai Lama, His yeah. Holiness. So, uh, mate, this is a yeah, bloody solid book. So, The Art of Happiness, uh, the Dalai Lama... Uh, this bloke named Howard C. Cutler went along to a few of his courses and was able to sit and interview um, the Dalai Lama. And so this Howard's put together all his lessons, I guess, yeah. into a book. So one of the main goals of the book was to combine the very best philosophies around happiness from the East and the West and combine it into one book, see what, uh, what areas are similar, what areas are different, and, and basically what we can, as Westerners, what we can take away from one of the, I guess, best spiritual teachers around the world at the moment who's, who's uh, gone through a lot of hardship in his life and oh, shit, yeah. he's uh, yeah he's come out clean on the other side and yeah, lots yeah and of even better from. for it. Yeah, man, I love it. I think, uh, I suppose most people know who the Dalai Lama is and what he looks like. Crazy little old Tibetan guy with his maroon robes. Yeah. He's a ledge. Well, uh, as a bit of a, an intro, let's see... Um, so basically, he was a. Is he the. How, what is he? He's the head of the Tibetan leg of arm of Buddhism, yeah? Yeah. Was he some kind of country like political leader as well? Uh, or not really? No, no just in, yeah, just in Tibet. So he, I think he led Tibet before uh, China came over. Yeah. China came in, raped and killed a lot of the Tibetans. So yeah. then the Dalai Lama, when he was like 13 or 14 years old, he was. So usually it t- they make him the leader when he had 18, 19, 20, but uh-huh. because all the, the stuff was happening, they said, oh, we need to get this guy in quickly. So the he was 13 of, or 14 when he... He was 13 or 14 or, or something like that when he first led Tibet. So he led yep. a bunch of people. This is in, in the book, by the way, guys. So he led a bunch of people from Tibet into India where he went into hiding for a bit and then tried to lead the country. And ever since nice. then, he's uh, been campaigning around the world to... Uh, yeah, for the freedom of Tibet. Yeah. Freedom of Tibet. So it didn't... So... Uh, China wanted Tibet, and Tibet was like, no, and then China like sent a whole bunch of people there to like overrule them. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. So basically, what did it say? He lived for, in exile for four decades, basically, um, and basically the whole country, like he had the fate of Tibet and their freedom on his shoulders, basically. Basically, yeah. yeah. Where are they at now? There was a bit of stuff going on a couple of years ago, wasn't there? Not sure. I think it'd be going the right direction, but I think yeah. there's still a fair bit of work to do. I don't think they're just going to be able to... China Take it back. Yeah, yeah, give it back straight away. I don't think, mate. What I really liked about this, obviously, he's the most entrenched in Tibetan Buddhism that you could possibly get. Like he's, but at the same time, um, Howard said that he was struck by his extraordinary readiness to take a fresh look and a fresh perspective at his own beliefs and practices. So even though he's the leader of this and this is his religion, he's very, very accepting of others, other religions, other ideas, other beliefs, and people. He's happy to say, like, question his own beliefs and yeah. practices. Yeah, that's something to be hugely admired about. Yeah. Like the, if he doesn't know the answer to a question, he'll actually say, I don't know and laugh about it, even if it's something to do with his, yeah. his religion. So, as opposed to the opposite of going on and, you know. Yeah, it's the opposite of the classic religious, dogmatic, Scientology style where they're just, it's, I this, can is, know this is it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. That's good. Mate, so what I liked, to segue from the Dalai Lama into the book, so the Dalai Lama said that whilst attaining a genuine and lasting happiness is not easy, it can be done. And so this book is all about achieving happiness. Mm-hmm. Do you want to kick off with chapter one? Yep, so chapter one, so the purpose of life, good question, but pretty simple when you're the Dalai Lama to answer. It's, yeah. uh, it is purely just to seek happiness. Yep. And this happiness can be achieved through training the mind. So this guy... He meditates for about four or five hours every day on everything. And so for him, it's all about training the mind to get this state of enlightenment, what the Buddhists call. And, uh, and yeah, so you can just chill out and enjoy, enjoy life. Yeah. So the Dalai Lama said, I believe the very purposes of our life is to seek happiness. That is clear. Whether one believes in religion or not, whether it's this religion or that, we are all seeking something better in life. And I think the very motion of our life is towards happiness. Hmm. And it's all about 
it is about seeking it in a sense. Um, as you say, it's about training yourself to it. And that's yeah. our purpose of life. It's not just letting the world happen and us trying to find happiness within that. It's about us um, consciously and actively trying to trying to achieve our own happiness, yeah? Yeah, spot on. So chapter two, it, it says the source of happiness. So he goes... He gives uh, two examples of people. So one person, one lady at the age of 32, one of his friends uh, retired because she had all these stock options and started a company and she retired a millionaire at 32. And, and she said, after the excitement of making the money, I don't think that I was happier than before. But on the other hand, you get people who are diagnosed with AIDS and sometimes they, like, as opposed to these hardships, they wake up and start to enjoy their life more. So... One of the lessons in, in chapter two is like happiness is not dictated by all this external stuff. It's mm. actually your perception of events and your internal outlook on everything. Yeah, bang, bang. Mate, he says that um, our moment-to-moment happiness is largely dependent on our outlook. So it's not about our absolute conditions. Uh, it's more of a function of how we perceive our situation and how satisfied we are with what we have. And so as you said, like it's about comparing. Um, mm. So he says that our feelings of contentment are strongly influenced by our tendency to compare. So it's like if you went 30 grand last year and then 40 grand this year, you think, oh, I'm happier than last year because I'm making more money. Or if you earn 100 bucks more than your brother-in-law, then you feel like you're pretty rich. Yeah. <laughs> that's what he says in here. Um, and so that's why, as you say, like comparing, when you compare from time to time, um, that's where, yeah, we're trying to compare to our past or other people to find happiness. Yeah. Uh, but instead, he says the four factors of fulfillment and happiness are wealth, worldly satisfaction, spirituality, and enlightenment. Together, they embrace the totality of an individual's quest for happiness. There you go. Bit of a the four factors. Little concoction. Yeah. That's good. So, uh, yeah, one of the, wor- the quickest ways to unhappiness, I guess, in juxtaposition is if you look at the, you know, the mainstream magazines and you're looking at all these fit, healthy bodies and... And all these wealthy people, and you're just thinking, why aren't I there? Why aren't I achieving all that? As opposed to that, you can think of the people going through hardships in the world, and then you know you can't help but just feeling blessed and lucky to, to have what we have. Yeah, mate, and that's a, yeah. So he says there's two ways to achieve inner contentment. So one method is to obtain everything that we want and desire: all the money, all the houses, all the cars, the perfect mate, the perfect body, uh, and that's yeah. So that's one way to get it: is if we achieve all of our wants and desires. Sooner rather than later, and then we're going to be happy. Yeah. Or the second way, a much more reliable method, is to instead just appreciate what we do currently have. Yeah. And that's it. That's that change of perception, change of mindset as to rather than thinking, oh, when I get rich, then I'll be happy. But instead being happy with what you've got now. Yeah. So for the Dalai Lama, it's, it's probably good to mention that there's we, do, we can't get happiness confused with pleasure. So something like uh, going out and having a big night with everyone and getting smashed on the booze. It's probably more to do with pleasure because on the Monday morning you have the dip and then it's you know yeah. the up and down cycle. And having sex, having sex is pleasure. Yes. Yeah. Oh, we'll wait for see the, the way it's superior, man. I reckon that can be sustained. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the, he said in here. He said in here something about sex is one of the happiest moments. That's yes. what some other guy said to the Dallas. He's like, no, that's not happiness. That's pleasure. Oh, yeah. Does he have it? Does he get it? Yes. Yeah, no, he's celibate. I don't think he's ever rooted ever. Jeez, he would. No, in a. Con- when you go to mind that powerful though, you can just fucking, you can just yeah. create whenever you want. Yeah. In your, in your he mind. must wank. Like, no, no he oh, it probably doesn't. Oh, I don't know. Fuck. Um, yeah. So, so we're getting to ch- chapter three. <laughs> <laughs> on, mate, we said pleasure, but what's happiness? Oh, just being a content guy. Yeah. You know, everything's everything's happening out there. But you ha- and actually, he says the biggest thing. This is one of the start of the book as well. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. And mm. if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. So it's all about <laughs> yeah, just sick. being compassionate and you'll be happy. So it's, yeah, that's sick. That's one of his simple formulas. And he's got a few uh, techniques to be compassionate. But yeah, so chapter three, training your mind for happiness. So his, uh, so the Dalai Lama's theory is like once your basic needs are met, so... After that, we don't need more money, more fame, or the perfect body, or the perfect mate. So once we get to this comfortable place of Maslow's hierarchy of needs yep. or whatever, then we don't need any more. That's just <clears throat> you're really striving for something that's not going to improve your life. Yeah, correct. So as you say that, we need that. Everyone needs that basic level. We need food. We need shelter. We need a bit of comfort. But once you've got that basic level, 
striving for more and more and more isn't going to make us happier. And so he said, he said that instead we should always, like when we're thinking of our decisions, he says instead of thinking, will this make me more money? And choosing, deciding whether to do something based on that, you should say, "Will this bring me more happiness?" Mm. And make the make your decisions based on on the the happiness it will or won't create. Yeah, that's right. So this is one of the the areas where we're different to animals, actually, because we some people, I guess, are, can be conscious enough of their own thoughts to realise when they're going down these are uh, negative emotions or getting angry or, or all these patterns. But if if you can be conscious enough, like the big dull eye, and you can step back and you, and you realize that's where that's leading you, then that's another way of training your mind for happiness. Mm. Realizing what patterns and what shits are leading you leading you to unhappiness as well. Yeah, and so a big part is the the mental discipline. So basically, all there is essentially, and this is kind of what Tony Robbins said: there's either like there's positive, you know, positive states and negative states. Or he doesn't say that. What did he say? He said there was suffering. And beautiful, maybe. Yeah, beautiful states yeah. and suffering states, and that, so that's what he what he kind of says here is is the Dalai says that uh, is that what you call him the Dalai for sure Dalai. Oh, La- yeah, we'll the Lama. Do we call him the Lama? We we'll call him the Dalai Lama. So he says that we want to identify and cultivate positive mental states and identify and eliminate negative mental states. So yeah, that's, so that's what we um positive stuff is going to bring us happiness. Negative stuff is yep. going to take us away from happiness. Yep. So taking a step back in an hour and an afternoon to like uh, to step back and reflect on what things in your life, and then and then I guess having the proactivity and initiative to take the actions to uh, just re just keep doing the things that lead to your happiness. Yeah, and it, mate, as you said there, it's just a matter of of doing it. Like you might think at the time you think, oh, something should happen. Did someone yelled at you at work? Yeah. And at the time, you're in this negative emotional state and you're not experiencing happiness and you think, it's, it's impossible for me to just snap out of this. And at, at the start, it's going to be tough, but the, but the DL said, no matter what activity or practice we are pursuing, there isn't anything that isn't made easier through constant familiar, familiar, fuck, famil, <laughs> familiarity and training. Yeah. And so he said that anything we do, obviously it's going to be tough the first time, but the more and more we do it, it's going to become easier and easier. Yeah. So if you're conscious of thinking, I'm, I'm in a shit mood right now, how can I get myself out of this? The more you practice it, the easier it will become. Yeah. It's like any skill. I yeah. Guess. Yeah. He says, going into, it's like just going to the gym. But, you know, we don't really think about a brain in that kind of way. We think about the gym training there and we get better at, get bigger muscles. But the exact same process can be applied to the brain to be more compassionate and, and uh, using these keys to, to become happier. Mm. Love it. So yeah, uh, so that's the the start of the book, and then there's some which we both really liked. Yeah, so the so the book's in a couple of a few different parts. So that was that was most of part one, the purpose of life. There's five parts in total. Part one was definitely my favourite. Yeah. I was yeah, that's where all my notes and highlights and everything are. And it, yeah, it, the other stuff's good. I just slowly dropped off. <laughs> slowly dropped off. I lost lost the connection. It's fucking good stuff though. That's all right, man. Yeah. So I. Uh, We'll go through some nuggets. Yeah. Uh, I liked... So the first time I read this a few years ago, the, probably the biggest learning that planted to see for me at the time was in the chapter five, the new model for intimacy. It's mm. So basically, I used to be a guy who's maybe... I guess like everyone, it's a little bit shy of people and a little bit unsure when, when, you, are, when you first meet them. But it's basically if you approach others with uh, a bit of compassion and you're not thinking of yourself and yet all of a sudden all this fear drops away... And you can approach every single person without fear and an openness. And like how they react to you will also be reciprocated. So if mm. you approach them in this kind of compassionate way and you and you and you trust them and you're open, it, it will be reciprocated. Yeah. And that since since just reading that chapter, it's like it's had a huge impact on me. Because in the past if I was a little bit suspect of people when I first approached them, usually mm-hmm. they reciprocate that as well. Yeah, and as you say, it's important that we don't wait for other people. We have to take that proactivity. We have to give us give it first before we can receive, yeah. essentially. So in many cases, people tend to expect the other person, I guess, to act first uh, and hopefully in a positive way. But if we go out and consciously um, give first and be positive first, then, as you say, more likely to be reciprocated. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so also another ripper was... I thought uh, chapter eight, facing suffering. So that 
So I guess hardships and, and all the challenges that everyone has in their lives is how to approach that because because even though they're Buddhists and they might be just chilling out in caves, meditating, <laughs> you know, as stereotype, they're still facing some challenge, a lot of challenges. Like these guys, especially the Dalai Lama, as we've mentioned to start this podcast, he has had some fucking wild mm. challenges that we, we might have a hard day at work. He's had brothers murdered in China. He's had yeah. his, his friends raped and murdered and he's been kicked out of his own home and all that. But mm. this guy, he still sees these challenges as opportunities for growth. So... When he, so when asked if he's uh does he hate Chairman Mao, who was the, the big dog at the time from China, who who fucked them all up, the whole time he had compassion for Chairman Mao, and he he saw him as an opportunity to grow as a person and and use these challenges and hate to practice his compassion even even more. Mm. Yeah, as you say, good opportunity to practice, and that's what he said. No one lives a life free from suffering and loss, and most of the time it's not going to be personalized like it's not going to be it wasn't like chairman Mao was like fuck i hate dalai lama get get out or yeah. maybe he did but anyway <laughs> but if you don't look at it as a, as a personal thing yeah then that's i think that's one way the dalai talks about combating that sort of suffering now i'm no expert on buddhism but i think a big part of buddhism is everything in life you're going to face suffering and it's just a matter of how to deal with that yeah is that kind of the main thing of yeah 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 say so one of the this is going a bit off topic one of the conversation we had the other day, our favorite thing about Buddhism is probably the only religion where they say, all right, these are our assumptions and these are our models. Go out and test it. Use science. They want science and everything to get around and test all these models. And then all of Buddhism has to change if there's uh, evidence to the contrary of what, of what they're predicting. So it's really interesting in that way and different to the other religions who always just seem to capitulate to whatever science. <laughs> Mate, Buddhism seems pretty sick. It's pretty cool, isn't it? I think it's one of the better... One of the better religions. Not that I'm into any religions at all, but Buddhism yeah. seems pretty good. If I was going to pick one, I'd probably go, yeah. go Buddhism. The Buddhism. But uh, so you're on that topic of challenge. So, you know, if you ask in your life, like, why the why am I getting challenged? Why am I getting cheated? What well, the Dalai Lama goes, all right, let's look, look at it the other way. Let's say if you, as soon as, soon as you were born, you come out of your, your mum's belly. <laughs> 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 and then everyone, as soon as you... <laughs> As soon as you get out, there's a doctor there making this goo goo noise, and your mum's there going goo goo ga 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 ga, and then everything's a challenge, everything's a breeze. That'd be that'd be absolute hell. There'd be no mental or emotional development. So they're, they're the two ends of the spectrum. So you got one at one end where life is hard, and one end where life is a piece of piss. So where <laughs> life is hard, it's shifting your perspective into where it's hard, and then then getting the emotional and mental development because of these challenges and growing as a person. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's one of the lessons that the big Dal Dal goes into. Love it, <laughs> Nicky Dal. Yeah, yeah, love it. Now, what about chapter twelve? Bringing about change. So he gives us a bit of a process of change. So he says the first step for change is, is learning. So obviously that learning is about understanding what's happening and understanding what you can do about it. Then the next step is developing conviction. So within yourself, after you've learned. Uh, Within yourself, developing that conviction, that commitment to want to change. And then that conviction turn, goes into determination. The next step is to transform that determination into action and actually do something about it. And then the most important bit is is sustained continuous effort. Yeah. So I think that's that's nothing groundbreaking. That's pretty standard. But that's, man, it's a good little, good little summary. Learning, conviction, determination, action, effort. Yeah. And as, as a side note to this, which I think is really cool and is he says a sense of urgency is very important. So one of the biggest parts of uh, Buddhism, according to the Dalai Lama, is uh, understanding impermanence in your life, that everything is going to change, that your days are numbered, mm. as for them, like for, in your body at the moment, your days are numbered. So understanding your impermanence, and if you don't have a sense of urgency, the things aren't going to get done in your life, or the growth, or the fulfillment. You're not going to get there if you don't have the urgency to get up and uh, do the shit you need to do. Love it. Mate, the Buddhist, Buddhists, they've got reincarnation, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, nice. Yeah. So yeah, that'd be a good one. Hey? That'd be good. Reincarn- yeah, it depends what, Come though. Back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mate, what about chapter 13, dealing with anger and hatred? Uh, <coughs> yeah. Mate, we've got a story here from uh, Shakyamuni, the Buddha. Yeah. So he says, if one... 
comes across a person who has been shot by an arrow, one does not spend time wondering about where the arrow came from or the cast of the individual who shot it or analysing the type of wood that the shaft is made from or any manner in which the arrowhead was fashioned. Instead, one should focus immediately on pulling out the arrow. How good is that? How good is that? Love it. So as he says, he says that all negative mental states are obstacles to our happiness. And it's saying that if, if someone's angry at you or someone hates you, he's saying that you shouldn't think, fuck, why is this guy angry at me? What did I do? Or what's, yep. what's pissed them off in their life? Or why are they angry at me right now? Instead, we just need to focus on stopping that anger first yep. and foremost, yeah? Yeah, exactly. So if someone says to you on Facebook, hey, you look fat in that photo, you don't just go, oh, fuck that person, I'm going to go and shoot. You just think, all right, I feel bad now and deal with that bad feeling and then analyze it and then let it go away that way and all that external stuff. It's kind of irrelevant. Yeah. So if you master that internal uh, attitude toward all, all the stuff, then yeah, rock and roll. Yeah, I love it. So uh, any any more uh, any more from any, any chapters? I think mate? that was... Mate, there's so much stuff in here that I've highlighted that we... Don't have time to talk about, but that was, that was the main stuff, I think. Yeah, so they're, they're the stuff book. we liked. I think probably the Buddhism is probably got that many layers to it, and we're probably me and you, we're we, you know, we're not that into it. So it's no. like we're probably only peeling the first layer, mm. but I'm sure because it's been tested over two and a half thousand years, there is so much layers to it, and so much uh, values, and you don't have to adopt. It's not like a religion where you have to like fucking, you know, do all that. Uh, do all these rituals and do everything they say. You can just take what you want from it, learn from it, and then, yeah, just adopt it into your own life. Yeah. <clears throat> Should we get the Dalai on? I don't yeah. think we'll get it. Mate, we, uh, we'll try, but we have got we do have a Buddhist monk coming on. Yeah. So that would be sick. Yeah. <laughs> um, mate, overall, what were your thoughts on the book? Yeah, I loved it. I'd, I'd recommend it to uh, every, yeah. every Westerner. It's just shit that we can learn. There's, you know, some of our biggest weaknesses in Western culture – Yep. can be fixed up by some of uh, the Eastern cultures' uh, mm. perspectives and philosophies, I think. For sure. As I said, I really, really love, say, the first 30, 40 pages. Yeah. For some reason, like, there was a lot of stuff in there that I loved, but I don't know what it was. I just wasn't... I don't know if it was the writing style I wasn't connecting with or the way he was doing it. Yeah. It was sort of more... I, I felt like parts I was just reading words as opposed to actually understanding it. Yeah. But there was some fucking good shit in there. Yeah, definitely. Would definitely read. Definitely yeah. must read, I'd say. So if you definitely, it's worth looking for people getting in, into a bit of uh, looking into a bit of the Dalai Lama, yeah, uh, his work. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome, man. Fuck yeah. Uh, what's next? So that's uh, oh, serious, oh, oh, serious oh, book coming. Mate, it's called The Way of the Superior Man, a spiritual guide to mastering the challenges of women, work, and sexual desire. Yeah. Interesting book. Interesting book coming, guys. Uh, should we sing that shit? So have a sing. Yeah. Dalai Lama. His actual name is Tenzin Gyatso. If you want others to be happy, practice If you want to be happy, practice compassion too. The purpose of life: happiness. Happiness. Antidote is content. Train your mind. For happiness, just meditate, just meditate. Give, don't wait to receive. Give first. Give it, give it, everybody, give it. Most of our suffering is self created. Instead, respond differently. change here's the process step one learning step two conviction step three determination step four action step five is effort be urgent be urgent all oh.